He never lets me dry And he hands me up for the world to see Even though I'm not complete I know He'll make a masterpiece of me At Rivertown Church, God matters, people matter, you matter. Let's uh, pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that today is the day you've made, God. We're going to be glad and rejoice in it, God. We thank you, God, that the Word of God says in Ezekiel 37, those words, that says you will cause dead things to come to life. And I thank you, God, today is a day that dead things come to life. God, that you are able to do it. God, there's nothing so dead that you can't bring it to life. And God, you are the God of resurrections. God, you are the God of second chances. You are the God of turnarounds and of comebacks, God. So God, we know that today is the day, God, that you are going to overwhelm our hearts and lives with the word of life that changes us forever. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. There was a man I heard about. His name was Nathan. I don't know if there's any Nathans here today, but the man I heard about named Nathan. I read a story. And Nathan had a girlfriend, and he had a best friend. Well, some things happened, uh, not of his doings, and it turned out that he found himself with a wedding invitation in the mail of his best friend and his girlfriend. Well, I don't know what you would have done. I don't know what I would have done, but Nathan chose to go. He went, stood right there, and he made it through the wedding okay without saying, like, I object. <laughs> you sorry, no good cheater. He didn't say that. He made it through the reception. It's a sit-down reception. It's nice, round tables with white tablecloths and beautiful food and beautiful music, and it's a head table. Now, he wasn't invited up close to the head table. He was back in the back. And when he walked into the reception, those who hadn't seen him in the back of the, of the church, when he walked into the reception, the rest of the people, uh, their goose pimples just went up on top of the edge of their skin if they didn't have them already. And, and their hair stood up on the back of their neck. And they thought, oh my gosh, he came. And he's there. Well, they had all the presentations and the presentation of the mother, the bride, the best man, giving the, giving the speech and all those kind of things. But right before the end, he... He stood up with his glass and he ding, 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 ding on his glass. Of course, like, if they had goosebumps before then and hair down on the back of their neck and they're turning red, then, like, it really doubled and tripled then. And so Nathan said, now that you've finished your chicken and sorbet, excuse me for a minute, but I have something to say. <laughs> he said, <coughs> he said, I know that these moments are amazing now that you've become husband and wife. And I just have something that I want to give you from the, from the depths of my life. And he said, I can't think of anything better to say today than a beautiful story, a fable, you hear? A fable of a tortoise and a scorpion. And he read these words. He said, the scorpion was hamstrung, his tail on a quiver, just how would he manage to get across the river? The scorpion said, the water's so deep, he observed with a sigh. He pricked at his ears. Uh, the tortoise was nearby. And the tortoise hearing said, well, why don't you swim? Asked the slow-moving fellow. Unless you're afraid, I mean. What are you, yellow? It isn't a matter of fear or whim, said the scorpion, but that I don't know how to swim. Ah, oh, forgive me. I didn't mean to be glib when I said that. I figured you were an amphibian. No offense taken, the scorpion replied. But how about you help me to reach the far side? You swim like a dream. You have what I lack. Let's say you take me across on your back. I'm not really sure that's the best thing to do, said the tortoise. Now that I see that it's you. You've a less than ideal reputation proceeding. There's talk of your victims all poisoned and 
bleeding. You are the scorpion, and how can I say this? But, well, I just don't feel safe with you riding on my shell. The scorpion replied, what would killing you prove? We both drown. So tell me, how about you behoove me to basically die at my own hand? How could that help? When all I desire is to be on dry land. The tortoise considered the scorpion's defense when he gave it some thought. It made perfect sense. This niggling little voice inside of his mind he ignored. He swam to the bank and called out, climb aboard. But just a few moments from when they set sail, the scorpion lashed out with his venomous tail. The tortoise too late understood that he blundered when he felt his flesh stabbed in his carapace center. As he fought for his life, he said, Tell me, why have you done this? For now we both surely shall die. I don't know, cried the scorpion. You should never trust a creature like me, because poison I must. I'd claim some remorse or at least some compunction, but I just can't help it, for my form is my function. You thought I'd behave like my cousin the crab, but unlike him, it is my nature to stab. The tortoise expired with one final quiver, and then both of them sank, swallowed up by the river. The tortoise was wrong to ignore all his doubts, because in the end, friends, our natures will out. Nathan paused, cleared his throat for a moment. The people were gasping for breath, wondering what would happen next. He cleared his throat, he took a sip of his drink, he needed these extra few seconds to think. The room had gone frosty. The tension was growing. Folks wondered precisely where Nathan was going. The prospects of skirting fiasco seemed dim. But what he said next surprised even him. So what can we learn about their watery ends, is what he said. What can we learn about their watery ends? Is there some lesson here, folks, on how to be friends? I think what it means is that central to living, a life that is good is a life that's forgiving. We're creatures of contact. Regardless of whether we kiss or we wound, life brings us together. Though it may spell destruction, we still ask for more since it beats staying dry. So lonely on the shore. So we make ourselves open while knowing full well it's essentially saying, come pierce my shell. Silence doesn't paint the depth of the frozenness in the room. No clinking silverware, no toasting the bride and groom. You could have heard a pedal as it landed on the floor. And in that stillness, Nathan turned and walked right out the door. <laughs> have you ever been in a moment that you couldn't tell who was your friend and who was your enemy? This sermon begins with a rhyme. It's not really what I do most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so speak and explain I must. And I hope I don't bore you to death in the dust. It's hard to quit rhyming when you do it so little. And I hope you don't fall asleep and have your drool dribble. <laughs> I don't know if I can stop this, folks. I don't know. <laughs> Today's message in this series called Jesus Life opens up, we're talking about the life of Jesus as how he explained what the life of Jesus looks like, not what we think it should look like, but as he walked through the scriptures in Matthew chapter 5, he began to tell us, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, don't lust, don't murder, if you think it in your heart, if you think it in your mind, uh, Go back to that title slide. We think it in your heart, you think it in your mind. He said, like, don't, don't think that just because you don't murder, it's not the same if you hate. He said, the Jesus life removes not only murder, but hate. He said, the Jesus life removes not only adultery, but lust. The Jesus life removes things that any amount of religion can never move. <coughs> remove. 
And the Jews at that time were under this idea that if you just follow the rules, everything will work out. And then so some people were good at following the rules and they judged the others who weren't able to follow the rules. But Jesus came on the scene and he said, look, there's a new way of life. It comes from inside. It comes from inside. And if you listen to what I've got to say, I, I bet you'd be able to go through these difficult days and be able to land in a place where you know that it's not just Jesus on the outside, but Jesus on the inside. Because what happens in your life is something much bigger and better than you could ever dream or imagine. It's the real, true life of Christ inside. So let's look past these rules as something so amazing, so different. And so today's message is called Frenemies. I looked at this graphic this morning. I hadn't seen it until this morning. I thought, Frenemies. I remember that show. <laughs> Friends. But Frenemies. The definition of a Frenemy is this. A Frenemy is someone who accesses their close relationship with you as a means to achieve selfishly driven ends. Mm. I've heard it described a little bit differently. You know, there's this drama in the world, you know, when there's so many people that have friends that what they like about each other is that they dislike, they like disliking each other. And there's so much drama in the world today. There's even this word drama. It's been coined to talk about people that are grown up that act like children with, uh, with fantasy anger stories that are usually played out on Facebook <coughs> or around the water cooler or somewhere, you know, but, but Jesus gives us this idea that's just amazing. Because he assumes that, and I don't know if you've ever assumed this. It's been something that I've lived a lot of my life denying that it's possible or that people really won't do this or something, but live life long enough, you realize there are some friends that act like enemies. And sometimes it gets joined together and you can't tell if you should bring this toys onto your shelf or not. If you should. And so there are people that Jesus says are going to attempt to access your close relationship with you and they're going to try to use you to achieve selfishly driven ends. I know this is not encouraging so far, is it? You're not leaving today going like, man, I'm so encouraged to go out there and live the Jesus life. I hope that it changes by the end of the day. Let's look what Matthew says in chapter 5. He quotes the words of Jesus. And this is one of those things where it's like, you've heard it said, but I tell you. You've heard it said, but I tell you. And he says this one is different. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Like, you shall love your friend and hate your enemy. And that was an Old Testament scripture, part of the law. You know, you should, it says, this is what people get what they deserve. You shall love your friends and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, just like I told you that if you hate someone, it's the same as murder. It's the same murder as heart. He's telling us this. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, the first thing I notice about this is something that I you know, don't always think about. Jesus assumes that you may have an enemy or two in life. I, I, like, this is not a sermon I normally preach, but I got here and I said, guess what? Jesus is saying you're going to have uh, some enemies in life. Because not everybody agrees with the Jesus life, Right? People aren't going to always go along. There are scorpions that want to climb on your shell and do you in because they don't know any better. They can't change themselves. And so how do I deal with it? Jesus says there's some, there's some people that are your friends. Love them. And there are some people that treat you like they're your enemies. And what's he say to do to them? Love them. Wait a minute. Jesus. Are you telling me to love my friends and love my enemies? Yeah. What about the scorpion? What about the scorpion that wants to pierce my shell? How do I tell the difference? How do I treat them different? Because to love a scorpion, you've got to know it's a scorpion. Right? 
And to love somebody who's not a scorpion, you can't treat the non-scorpion like a scorpion. And you can't treat the scorpion like it's not a scorpion. But a lot of us, we take our shells out into the world and we say, I can handle it. Bring on the scorpions. I mean, you might have a personality like me that just throws himself into a pit of scorpions and says, oh, God will take care of me. <laughs> yeah, I've done that so many times. You know, I got the, maybe you're like me, you've had some wounds to prove it. Maybe you're the kind of person that's just like glasses always half full. You know, they got a tail. I don't think they'll hurt me. But maybe you're a person that says like this, look, if they got a tail, I'm not going anywhere near this star sucker. I'm not going anywhere near this guy. It's like, like, they can be somebody else's friend. If they climb on your back, I'm leaving. We have these twin personalities and the ones who always feel like they need to be in there in the thick of it with all the scorpions. I mean, they just, they spiritualize that so much, don't they? Oh, just take another one for Jesus. Oh, take another one for Jesus. Oh, take another one for Jesus. Jesus said, love your enemies. The other kind of personality says, Jesus says, love your enemies, but he didn't say, let them climb on your back. <laughs> well, I'm here today with hopefully some practical things to help us tell the difference. How to love our enemies without them climbing on our backs. Here's a sign of a friend. Let's talk about signs of a friend. Number one. When you find yourself explaining away their behavior, now you're going to start to have names flash in your mind. You're going to have like family members flash in your mind. Okay, now I want to make something real clear. Um, a spouse can't be a friend of me. Okay? Okay? A spouse can't be a friend of me. I mean, there may be problems there, but you know, there's a covenant involved. You don't make covenants with your friends, right? It's not the same. Some of this may apply. But let's talk about friends. When you find yourself explaining away their behavior, you know, like, they don't. They didn't mean to do it. Right? They wouldn't do it again. You don't understand. You don't understand why they are this way. Let's look at another. Uh, when you tell yourself the relationship is worth it because of the other things they do for you. Now, Remember the definition of a friend of me? When someone who accesses their close relationship with you as a means to achieve selfish driven ends? Be careful on this second one because they've already gotten to you. Because you're already saying, well, they have selfishly driven ends, so I, well, the way to deal with them is for me to have some selfishly driven ends because it's okay because there's other things that they do for me that aren't these kind of things, but they do other things. Does that make sense? That's a sign you're starting. You just took the wrong turn when that measurement starts to happen. <clears throat> Number three, when they treat you good, but other people badly. <clears throat> they treat you good, other people badly. It, the, our pride gets in the way because they start thinking like, you know, I'm really special to them. I'm really special to them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do me the way they do other people. I mean, you see how it plays into, the, into your pride? A prideful person usually brings up pride in you or in me. And I, I remember this so well. I, I remember in the seventh grade, a boy named Billy Baker sat me down. He was in the eighth grade. And he said, David, let me tell you how to be popular. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, David, you find one group of people, you be uh, so nice to them. Do everything possible. Just, just, just do everything for them. Be super nice to them. And another group of people, be really mean and bad to them. Good people will talk about you. That's what he said. He said, then people will talk about you. And then people will fight. He said, and then you'll have to fight. You'll have to either be able to really fight or able to really bluff. And once he said you'll have to be able to really fight or really bluff, I knew he was a bluffer. Right? Tell me that I'm thinking like, God, lady, what is this? This is what junior high's about. Uh, uh, this is, a, you know, I, I don't know. How about number four? Number four. When you feel good about yourself because this friend needs your help. Now, is it wrong to have people need your help? No. It's right to have people need your help. You know what's wrong? 
is when how you feel about yourself is determined by how much you help them. Because at that point, you're not helping them. You become someone who's using them to make you feel like a person who's helpful. And that's not helpful. When you feel good about yourself because they need my help. They just need my help. You don't understand them. They need my help. They treat other people bad. They treat me good. Like, I, like I'm, I'm really special. You know how they got all those people that they treat badly? Those are the people they used to treat good. Look at the next one. Number five. When you find yourself repeatedly initiating relationship repair. You know, like, when you feel like that, think to yourself like, I think I'm doing all the work in this friendship. You know, when we do that, we train the other person that we're always going to do all the work in the friendship. You know, whatever is allowed becomes the new normal. <coughs> whatever is allowed becomes the standard. You know that raising children, right? Whatever you allow, that's the standard. But friends is the same way. Now, is it good to initiate relationship repair? Absolutely, it's good to initiate relationship repair. It's fantastic. But after you've done it the 10th or 12th or 13th time, it might be okay for you to wait for them to come to you. All right, how about this next one? When you say, but I need him or her right now. Now remember, like, who's the friend of me now? Because, but you need them right now. Who's using who? But I need him or her right now. Let's look at number seven. When other common friends either warn you about them or start to choose sides. You know, when all of a sudden, you don't know why, but it seems like one of your friends has chosen a side. You know what that means? It means there have been conversations. Right? It means there have been conversations that you weren't part of. Now, these are the people that God says in the passage, love your enemies. Just because someone doesn't announce themselves as your enemy doesn't mean they're not behaving like one. And so, uh, he says, love your enemies. You know what the most important thing to do in order to love your enemy is? Is to realize this person's being an enemy. I can't love them like a friend. If they don't act like a friend, I have to love them differently than a friend. I have to love them like an enemy. Because if I love someone who's an enemy like they're a friend, and I treat them like a friend of me, I'll keep on being angry with them. And how can I love them if I'm angry with them? What's wrong with you? I thought you were my friend. They knew they weren't your friend. Only you didn't know. Other people knew they weren't your friends. Only you didn't know. But when I come and I say, God, like, I'm able to love this person when I accept who they are. Does that make sense? I love them as they are. I love them who they are. In fact, I can even begin to really have a real serious relationship repair. If I don't if I don't hold this person up to a standard that they never intended to meet, where did that standard come from? That standard came from me. They never walked into my life saying they wanted that kind of thing. They never walked into your life saying, I intend to treat you this way, and I intend to treat you this way, I intend to be like this. No, we just wanted that from them. And sometimes we want the right thing from the wrong person. Uh, that's a friend of me. But you treat them like they're a friend. And then you're angry with them because they're not a friend. See how that works? Now, signs of a friend. Let's talk about this. What do you do about that? How to be a loyal friend and love your enemies. How to be a loyal friend and love your enemies. So much drama comes in life when you don't realize who somebody really is. You can love somebody exactly how they are if you realize how they are. How to be a loyal friend and love your enemies. Number one, pray and ask God for wisdom and loyal friends. Pray and ask God for wisdom and loyal friends. You know, that's a good prayer to have. Instead of like wondering why it doesn't happen sometimes. I, God, would you please show me in wisdom? James 1 says, 
If anyone lacks wisdom, they should ask of God, and God will give them wisdom. It says that they'll, he'll give them that wisdom so they won't like be a, a somebody tossed by waves. You ever been like tossed by waves in relationships? Without any kind of mooring on anything that will keep you grounded? Just tossed by this wave, tossed by this wave, tossed by another wave. Pray and ask God for wisdom and loyal friends. Proverbs 18.24 says, a man with too many friends comes to ruin. Like, that's the, I don't remember that in the Bible. I'm like, I'm trying to read the Bible. I'm trying to look at the Jesus life for what Jesus says the Jesus life is. And I look at Proverbs. And Proverbs is part of the scriptures. Wait a minute. I like having more friends. I like having more friends. The Bible says, if you have too many friends, if everybody's your friend, See, I can befriend everybody, right? But if I have too many friends, if everybody from any level has that kind of access to my life, I come to ruin it. It says something about me, not about them. It says, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that a great scripture? A real friend is usually somebody who's closer than a brother. Closer than a brother. Look at number two. Befriend and help everybody. Befriend and help everybody. But don't have expectations that everyone will treat you like you treat them. Befriend and help everybody. But don't give everyone the same access to your life. Don't give everyone else the same access to your life. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the issues of life. So the, the box around my heart says this. It says, inside this box, Jesus owns this. Jesus owns my identity. Jesus owns this. I, when I give my heart to Jesus in salvation, like, dear Jesus, I give you my heart. You know what he does? He takes it. But when we aren't careful with our hearts, we walk around passing out to other people the heart that belongs to Jesus. We got to be wise about who we pass our heart out to. Now, I'm all, if you know me, I'm all for transparency. I'm all for an open life. But you know what? If you live long enough, you'll find some scorpions, won't you? You'll find some. You'll have a pierced shell, won't you? Now, is it wrong to carry a scorpion on your back and get a pierced shell? It can happen. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It means that God is saying to you and to me, I want to show you the difference. And beyond all that, who can hurt me that God can't heal me? So what if I'm not wise? What if I don't get it? Can somebody hurt me in a way that God can't heal me? Are they, are they more powerful to hurt me than God is more powerful to, powerful to heal me? I think so. Don't give everyone the same access to your life. But Matthew 16, 20 is when Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, who do you say that I am? And they're saying you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. They're saying there are all these things about you and you're healing people and changing people's lives. And some people are saying you're the Messiah. But you know, so Jesus turns it around on his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up with boldness and he says, I say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus does not at that moment hand Peter a megaphone and put him on the radio to talk about himself. <clears throat> you know what Jesus said to Peter at that moment? He said, shh, don't tell anybody. I'm thinking, I've got to pay attention to this. Jesus had not yet got to the place that he believed that the people could handle who he was. He was, he was going to disclose his heart, his divinity to them in a way that helped them and didn't help him. See, at that moment, Jesus could have proclaimed who he was as the Messiah and forced everyone to bow down to him and treat him as though he should be treated. But you know what he did? He let each person discover who he was. Not because of what he said, but because of who he is. And when that person accesses Jesus' life force, his spirit, his divinity, his godhood, when that person accesses that, because they want to, 
That's when they change. Not because they're forced to. Number three, how to be a loyal friend and love your enemies. Simply do unto them as you would have them do unto you. And how do we forget that? Simply do unto them as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. Because if I do that, then I'll think to myself, like we get to that moment in my life where I'm thinking, what? What do I do? What do I do? I can't forget the golden rule. Now, now I love number four. I'm going to park here for a minute. It says, decide in advance that you will never advance your life at a friend's expense. Oh, this, this, let us soak in for just a minute. You know, the best decisions in life are the ones you make in advance. Decide in advance that you will never advance your life at a friend's expense. Because if I have a God in heaven who has a plan for my life, it does not involve me advancing my life faster than God would do it without hurting someone else. And so sometimes we're like, I want to stop here for a minute because you think we're talking about other people sometimes, but there's these moments in which you're in a conversation, okay? And somebody's name comes up. Have you ever felt that little temptation to say something negative about somebody else? You ever felt that? I think if everybody was honest, you'd say, yeah, yeah. That's the moment that I go from friend to friend of me, hoping nobody finds out. See, why would I do that? The reason I would do it like all of us have done it. It's so that I can notch ahead in that person's perception of me. And any time I bring up like, yeah, yeah, but let me tell you about this person. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you about this person. Does it help the person I'm talking to? I mean, they will remember what I said about that person until they die. That's a lot of years, right? They'll remember forever. And it might not make them look at the other person negatively. It might make them look at me negatively. If they're wise, all of a sudden, they, it's not that they've chosen not to distrust that other person. They've chosen to stop trusting me because I'm a person who talks about other people. And if a person talks negatively to you about other people, they will talk negatively about, if that person talks negatively to you about other people, they will talk negatively about you to other people. Does that make sense? They will. And so in my life, I can't be that person who's willing to help God out to move my life ahead. I can't be the person that's willing to help God out to move my perception of who I am ahead by the way I paint other people. I can't do it. Because I have a God in heaven who's in charge. I have a God in heaven who sees it. And you know, you've heard this thing about karma, right? The karma. You know, do you know that's not Christianity? Karma has to do with the law of the Hinduistic, Buddhist universe that, you know, there's this universalistic balance and any time that you, you know, impact that balance, it's going to balance back like some kind of an equilateral balloon. When you're a Christian, it's not about karma. It's about the verse in God's word in Galatians 6, 7, that says God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, that you will also reap. Whatever you sow, that you will also reap. The sign of the man, you'll not never advance your life at another friend's expense because you know what will happen? If I sow that, you know I'm going to reap? Somebody else will advance their life at my expense. They might not do it anyway. But then I don't want it to happen because I've sowed that. See, even if it's done to me. See, because it's not about karma. It's about a God in heaven who sees. It's about a God in heaven who says, who I'm supposed to have a healthy reverential fear toward. That he made this other person. He gave them life. He doesn't look at them and say, you know, you're better than them. And so you get to do more than them. And you get to have more than them. You know how this happens. You know, 1 Peter 3, 9 says, don't repay evil for evil, but give a blessing instead. How can I do that? How can I not repay evil for evil? It's because I have a God that can bless me more than what that other person can take away from me. How can, how can somebody take something away from a child of God when everything they have has been given to them by God? 
Everything they have has been given to them by God. But I'm sitting around thinking, oh, God, I hope they don't. What did they do to me, God? What if this person? What if that person? And, and in the moment that I'm trying to tell the difference between my friends and my enemies, I become an enemy too. Because you reap what you sow. Number five. Always forgive and let go of every betrayal before you come, become infected with bitterness and repeat the pattern. Let's say that together. <laughs> Let's say it together. Say it with me. Always forgive and let go of every betrayal before you become infected with bitterness and repeat the pattern. One more time. Always forgive and let go of every betrayal before you become infected with bitterness and repeat the pattern. Isn't that a good word? I straight out of the God's word. Hebrews 12, 15. Look it up with me. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See, because if I have a, a friend that treats me like an enemy and accesses their close relationship with me, if you have a friend who treats you like an enemy, who accesses their close relationship with you in order to achieve a selfish end, I have a God in heaven who deposits more than the frenemy withdraws. I have a God in heaven who is able to deposit grace. Because if, if I'm a child of God and my source is God, okay? If I'm God-centric, then why does it happen? Why, do people, why are there betrayals that come into our lives at times? Let me tell you why it happens. Every betrayal has a purpose. There's no such thing as something that comes into your life that doesn't come through the fingers of God. Every betrayal has a purpose. And no person, no betrayer can ever take away your purpose, can ever take away your calling, can ever take away your destiny. If your job is taken away, your home's taken away, other things are taken away, do you know what can never be taken away is your calling from God. And if you lose physical, practical things and people and relationships and it affects your destiny and your calling from God, then that destiny and calling didn't come from God. Because people can't take away what God gives me. People can't take away what God gives me. It says, see that no one falls short of the grace of God. What's the grace of God? Grace, the God's grace G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's his unmerited favor. It's his deposit in my life. It's his choosing of me as his child. It's his care for me as his child. And so when a betrayal comes into your life, when a frenemy walks in, when all of a sudden you thought you could trust, but there's no trust. And you have to downgrade that friend through the friend of me down to enemy, okay? And you have to stop loving them as a friend and start loving them as an enemy. And pray for them because they've persecuted you. When you have to downgrade your opinion down to the point that you pray for them and you love them and you care for them and don't let them climb on your back anymore. And you have to do that. You come to a holy God and you say, God, don't let this poison enter my soul and make me like them. You know, there's a consistent pattern in the abusers of the world. Okay? The consistent pattern in the abusers of the world is this. Abusers of the world are usually abused. Hurt people hurt people. But people filled with grace People feel the grace of God can stand up and say, I've been hurt, but I won't hurt. I've been stung, but I won't sting. I've been poisoned, but I won't poison. <clears throat> There's no bitterness that's going to take root in my life. The rest of the passage says, see that no one comes short of the grace of God and then no root of bitterness. Not like a root, it's low, it's loads, down deep in the ground. It's silent, it's hidden. But if there's a root in there, you know what's going to come out? The fruit of the root. And you got to go into your heart sometimes and you got to dig out those things as if they are betrayals that have to come out and be offered to God. So you go to the altar of God and you say, God, I'm not just giving you my love, God. I'm giving you my enemies. 
God, I'm giving you my hurts, God. I've got to give you this bitterness, God. And it's like calling 911, and there's a grace ambulance in heaven. You know, it's like, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, this is heaven. How can I help you? Could you send the grace ambulance to me? I've just been betrayed. Yes, sir. Is there an emergency? Absolutely there's an emergency. I thought they were my friend, but they treated me like an enemy. God, they said, well, they're already there. The help is already there. When I turn to God, and so what happens is this. In the midst of a betrayal, you know what I can do and what you can do? I can say, thank you, God, for teaching me. Thank you, God, for teaching me that you are more trustworthy than people. That I can trust anybody, God, if I trust you more. Isn't that good? I can trust anybody if I trust you more. I can listen to everybody if I listen to you more. God, I can help anybody if you help me more. In that moment, if I turn away in disgust and bitterness, you know what it says about me? It says, I believe that I, tr I, says I trust that person with my life and what they can do to hurt me more than I trust God they can help me. See that no one comes short of the grace of God and a root of bitterness comes up and many be defiled. Many be defiled. Well, before we end today, I want to tell you lastly about how to tell the difference in two kinds of betrayals. There's a Judas betrayal. You know Judas, right? Judas betrayal. A Judas betrayal, uh, it's how do you know who's Judas? How can Judas get close? They're close enough to kiss you. So that's how he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. But the Judas betrayal, it's a betrayal of pride. You know, he, he betrayed Jesus because he wanted to get done what Jesus wouldn't do. He, he took over in his pride and he didn't, he, he was discouraged and, and felt abandoned that he didn't get what he wanted his way. And so I, Jesus doesn't do for me what I want Jesus to do. I'll turn Jesus over. People do that. And it says later, it says he, G, that Jesus knew that, that Judas he went back and threw the money back at the priest, and it says he went and hung himself. I find it interesting in Scripture that Jesus didn't go stop Judas from hanging himself. He didn't go and get up under the tree and say, stop, Judas, stop. You can't fix prideful people. When prideful people fail, you can't fix them until their pride is broken. And if you stand in the way, you'll get broken with them. All you can do is pray for them and painfully watch them hang themselves. That's how you can love your enemies. Because they will get what they sow. They will reap what they sowed. It will probably be later than they sowed. It will probably be more than they sowed. But they will reap what they sowed. And I can love them and pray for them. You can love them and pray for them. Not hate them. Not feel bitterness towards them. Because there's a God in heaven who's bigger than me and bigger than you. And I can't fix prideful people. Only God. He's doing, he's doing it every day. In fact, he's doing it in you and me right now. You ever heard that? You know, don't attack this person back. Don't, don't come against this person. Don't answer their accusation. Just leave it alone. And that, that guy's going to hang himself in front of people one day. He's going to hang himself on the job. He's going to, it's going to, we're not talking about like ropes and suicide. We're talking about people who eventually are found out to be who they are. And if they don't eventually find out who they are, they can't change. And then there's another kind of betrayal. It's a Peter betrayal. If Judas' betrayal was a betrayal of pride, you know what Peter's betrayal was? It was a betrayal of weakness. Think about it. That they are in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter whips out the sword. He slashes at the, the servant of the high priest, Malchus' ear. He's like, I'm here for you, Jesus. If they take you, they're going to take me. And Jesus says, calm down, Peter. And all the other disciples, they were... They scattered. But Jesus was followed by Peter. And they ended up there in the courts of the high priest. And, and they're beating Jesus in the face. And they're holding him down. And they're torturing Jesus. 
And there's Peter. And, and Peter wants to stand up for his Lord. He wants to stand up for his Lord. He wants to make a difference. He wants to make it okay. He wants to see it changed. He wants it more than anything. And you know what happens? Peter starts to speak and he wants to say like, that's my Lord. He wants to rip out his sword again and attack the attackers of his Lord. And he opens his mouth and he says, I don't know him. I don't know him. And he says, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. When Jesus was resurrected, he came back. And Peter had left the ministry and gone out and went back to his old life and fishing. And Peter went and met them. He was met by Jesus on the shore. And he brought Peter in and he cooked him breakfast on the shore. And he gave Peter a chance to tell Jesus he loved him once for every one of the betrayals. For every denial... Peter had a chance to give love. But this is what I want to say about Peter. <clears throat> the rest of them, the rest of the 11 disciples, weren't even there to have a chance to either deny him or not. They weren't even there. Sometimes you have friends. They are, they are doing their absolute best. And sometimes you're the friend who's doing your absolute, complete best. Judas, you can't help. But Peter, Peter, you're about to have a better relationship with Peter than you've ever had with anybody. Because if you go to Peter in his weakness, when you wait for him to realize his wrong and then go and encourage, restore, and strengthen his heart and say, I know you tried. I know you tried. I know you showed up for me and you did your best. You just, you're about to go to a higher level of love than you've ever had. You go through the deep tunnel of conflict and betrayal to come out on the other side, helping each other with their weaknesses, loving each other through difficulty and seeing each other's lives transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So there are times at which I gotta say, God, you're just scorpion calling me over here. God, will you tell me what to do? I'll do what you tell me, and I'll trust you with the results. Take your shell out into the world and use it the way God tells you to use it. Live with it the way God tells you to live with it. And believe that God will protect you in every situation, that he's more than enough. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this message today. And I thank you for what it means today, God, to be a person of God. That a person, God, who is willing to risk it. Is willing to risk it with people. And to have a God who's always able to repair our hearts. To help us to be the strong people of God we're meant to be. If you're here today and you want to have a relationship with that God, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, then you can pray simply right now. Pray, dear Jesus, come to my life. You pray, dear Jesus, come into my life and I ask you to save me from my sins. I realize right now, Jesus, I, I need you and I love you. If you've never accepted Christ in your heart right now, this is your time and this is your moment. Pray simply with me, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need your salvation. Pray simply with me, dear Jesus, I, I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you, Jesus, and I accept you into my heart as my Savior forever. I accept you into my heart as my Savior forever. If you're here today and you pray with me, receive Christ as your Savior. I know that you've made a decision that's a decision of a life. I thank you that you've been willing to, to step out in a way that no one else has. God, I thank you, God, that you're going to make a big difference in this person's life. God, I pray that in this moment, God, that you would bless everyone here today, God, and heal hearts, Jesus, resurrect friendships, God, let people be able to go to other, other people, God, when they've experienced difficulty and say, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here to be strength for you in your weakness. 
I'm here to help you when you fail. And I trust you. See, then I pray, Lord Jesus, that we'll turn to you in every relationship, knowing that you can do so much more than we could ever believe. Imagine. Would you just stand up with me today? Just stand up with me. As the band leads us in this song today, let's just worship God with this song as we close. God Church, God matters, people matter, you matter.